Imagine sitting on a New York City train, eavesdropping on a conversation where a wise man shares his thoughts about money, how to make more of it, how to be content with what you have, and how to get past certain obstacles in life that may slow you down. This conversation with Shmuel Goodman should be bookmarked and listened to over and over and over again so you live a happier, more enjoyable life. Enjoy. Being a Jew? Awesome. Managing personal finances, not so awesome. Welcome to Kosher Money. We're here with Shmuel Goodman, and everyone's going to ask me, who is Shmuel Goodman? What should I tell them? Shmuel Goodman is a businessman in Chicago, Illinois, that has some wonderful kids, that has had an economic journey that uh, is compelling because it's atypical from the background he's from and where he ended up today from where he was when he was in his 20s. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Bexley, Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, Central Ohio. Columbus. I would say Bexley would be like saying you're from, you know, Beverly Hills or Great Neck or Ball Harbor or something like that. It's a small Jewish, wonderful community in Central Columbus, Ohio area. So what happened between growing up in Columbus and where you are today? Take us through the journey. Start from yeah, the I'd say the key thing in uh, Bexley, Ohio, is you know my goal is to be a young leader. I was involved with the Federation. And uh, to be a leader, to be a player, you had to be a wealthy person. And that was a big drive. At that time, I hadn't seen tefillin, anything of observance, until my 20s when I moved to New York City. So... Uh, that was my goal to be a billionaire. That's your, you know, my mentor was Les Wexner, who was a gifted businessman and was very kind to me. So that was kind of my journey. Moved to New York City after graduating from Wash U in St. Louis and worked at Abraham and Strauss, which is like Macy's. And then had my first Shabbos kind of in New York City with my buddy Rick Schottenstein. From the art school Schottenstein? Uh, his cousin. His cousin. So we're very close. And I got exposed to kind of traditional Judaism that way. And although I knew I didn't know anything, I knew I hadn't done anything wrong. And eventually, on a blind date, when I moved back to Columbus to become a billionaire, I left Abraham and Strauss, moved back to Columbus to open up some stores. My folks had a chain of stores, three stores they uh -huh. had. And I was going to grow them to hundreds and mimic my mentor, Les Wexner, as a young man. So it sounds like your goal of attaining wealth, you were doing pretty well, right? You were you were growing the business. It was a retail store? Retail, children's clothing store. Okay. And uh, there are three strip centers, and my goal was to say, Mom, Dad, let's take him into major regional malls. How'd that work? It that went go? very well. There was a shortage of uh, the malls didn't have enough kids wear, and I was able to get those locations in 10 states over time, but you had to build a team and a staff. There's a tremendous amount of work. And uh, again, Wexner was, I knew some of the developers helped me. And so over time, built a team and a staff. And during that period of time, I was uh, looking to buy a chain of stores in St. Louis. And during that process, one of the owners said they had a niece in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And that that's ended up being my wife. Mm -hmm. I went on a blind date with her and she had started to become observant. And that's probably the biggest miracle of my life to meet Sharon Devorah. So it started out as three stores at its peak. Where, where were 42 you? stores. 42 stores. Wow. And, you know, you people look at you like, you know, you're going to be a player. When are you going public? In the meantime, you know, ultimately our numbers weren't looking so great. I say the three C's will kill you, cancer, competition, and complacency. But competition, we really didn't have a huge edge, you know, between kids or us on the, on the pads, uh, Gap Kids, this long before Amazon. We started to, you know, uh, have red ink. You know, it was very traumatic because, you know, you're a big guy. You know, things are looking great. And uh, Baruch Hashem, you know, we were blessed to have children, uh, first two children in Columbus. And eventually, when they started to lose money, I uh, didn't want to raise money capital, which the board, the advisory board said that we should do. And I did it for one day and I couldn't do it, Ellie. I said, I won't raise, I don't believe in it strategically. Mm. And that's something that I learned. Sometimes I'm a very steadfast person, yet you have to know when to quit. So that's not simple. It's like fusion of opposites. And thank God I quit. And it wasn't fun. You know, I lost my job, my dreams, my equity, and it was humbling. At, at your peak, 
what would you say your net worth was? Uh, I'd say sales, you know, in 1989, $1991 dollars was about $20 million. $20 million. Something like 20 to $22 million, something like that. And eventually you filed for bankruptcy? No, I left and then probably a year later or a year and a half later, they tried to put together, the creditors tried to come up with a plan. Mm. And it's funny, we were advised by some very smart people that you can't go through a chapter 11 when you're that small. When you're huge, like a Donald Trump, you're too big to file. This was, you're not going to really make it through a chapter 11. And the company did not. But at that time, Sharon and I, I took a job working in St. Louis. And while I was there, there was an actual filing. Mm. And it was tough because my parents were still involved with the business. And it was, you know, not a fun time. So I had moved to St. Louis. Sharon's late father passed away. I came down with Hodgkin's lymphoma at that time and uh, was in a new business. And then there was the actual, you know, court filing stuff in Columbus. So a bunch of stuff in my mid, late 30s that I don't forget. I think about it a lot. How old were you when you were diagnosed with cancer? 37. So it was funny because, Ellie, you know, when someone gets sick, you don't say why you got sick. You can't tell me why Shmuel Goodman got sick. But to myself, I think about the Lubavitcher Rebbe says, when someone's essence is not in alignment with their actions, there's disease. And when I think that my goal is to be rich, I'll do whatever it takes to be a player, to be a leader. So I'll do stores, I'll run a team of people. And looking back, that wasn't essentially what my gift was, what I was meant to be doing. And then I had Hodgkin's lymphoma and you know, I had to go through chemo, radiation. It was very rough. At what age did you become Orthodox? When I told you I was in New York City, when I met Sharon on that blind date, um, I was 28 years old in, let's say, May of 84. And when we ended up choosing to, you know, to be, to get married, I committed to being kosher and keeping Shabbos. And I meant it. I knew it was Emmas. But Ellie, I was a long way from, my wife said I wasn't a Balchuva returning to, to Yiddishkeit for many years. It was very, my ascension was extraordinarily slow. Uh, I'm not a quick study type thing. So you see me with a beard, a kapata, there's some of these, you know, uh, frock. I'm 67 years old. So it took a long time, but it's very deep. So when we, we met, I was from when I was in Columbus, but then we lived in St. Louis for three and a half years. And eventually in St. Louis, I was in the neckwear business that her late father was in. And I was there for three and a half years and it wasn't a fit for me. And I chose to leave that business and start my own investment advisory firm. And that's part of the miracle. And so I started this, it's called the Neste Group. I strategized it from, if you will, Ellie, all the pain that I had in retail. Retail is a, a bad business. Uh -huh. So looking back, you know, sometimes just, you, you could be a great manager in a bad business. Warren Buffett noted that in Berkshire Hathaway, it was textile. So, but retail, I learned a lot of wonderful skills. So I always like to help people, you know, when I'm younger, with stereos, TVs, cars, eventually homes. And they asked me about money stuff. I would buy stereos for them. No money. You know, even Jay Schottenstein will tell you, I bought a stereo for him when we were younger in right. college. He gave me money just go, because he knew that, you know, Steve would buy a good stereo. So um, I took that to money management. I said, how do I do that? So I took six months to strategize my investment advisory firm in St. Louis. What were some of the key takeaways you took out of the retail business that you feel are present today sure. and top of mind? Uh, I would say the term delivery, of what delivery dates meant when you're a retailer and a wholesaler, that when someone says they're gonna deliver you goods, the, the sellers that are amos that are honest and ones that aren't, to follow through is everything and delivery. And ultimately caring. So I'm you know, kind of an emotional person. So if you will, servicing people and caring about their money, is ultimately a better fit for me. And oftentimes people, they want to make a lot of money, but really it's the intersection of where my gifts are and where the market has a need. And looking back in my late thirties, you know, I really care about people deeply. Mm -hmm. And there was a need for people that didn't know how to run their own assets, you know, with a half a million dollars and up at that time. And um, they trusted me and I strategized this business. And some of my best friends that I grew up with in Bexley, Jewish and non-Jewish, so were just waiting for me. They go, I'd love you to do this. I trust you with anything without, you know, really vetting so deeply. So I started this 
nest egg. It's called a registered investment advisory firm. So I'd like you to know what that is. That's the trend in the business. Someone might leave a Morgan Stanley or leave and they start their own independent group. Mm-hmm. It's called RIA Channel. It's about 30% of the entire market. It used to be 14%. Mm-hmm. It's 10 trillion and getting bigger. And I started with that and it's Braha. You know, I want you to know that it's a blessing. Yeah, you know, I wasn't such a hacham, and I and my custodian was Charles Schwab, who's the 800 pound gorilla. So I chose that. That was smart. That was a blessing. And trust me, starting uh, an RIA is not an easy thing because you're going to make 1% of assets under management and under. So it's hard to start up. So I started it. And then within six months, my wife asked if we can move to Chicago, Illinois to be in a larger Jewish community. Mm. When, when you got your diagnosis, what what changed in your mindset? Specifically, money. Obviously, you were nine years into being, eight years into being from, so right. your mindset already changed. But what, what goes through your mind when, when you get a diagnosis like that? I would say it brings up my competitive juices, that within the realm of this reality, which someone, whenever you get hit with something that is rough, to immediately go into survival and go within the realm of this reality, how can I behave in the top decile of people with this diagnosis? Not why did I get sick? So I just wanted to comply, connect with my doctors and move through. I can't say I was angry. I was definitely scared. Uh And I imagine, you know, am I going to be with my wife? You know, Joseph Telushkin wrote me a beautiful card. He said, Steve, I look forward to dancing with you at your children's weddings. Uh Now, not being from a firm home, an observant home, I didn't, I never thought about that. You know, it's not something I thought about, nor did I think of dying, but primarily just to be a good patient and to try to physically take care of myself. But while I was going through that, Ellie, literally, I had a creditor suit from Columbus when I was in St. Louis. I had my first IRS audit in my life during the same period. My hair is falling out from the chemo, and I was going through uh, some challenges in the family that my my wife is sharing, the the tie business that I had worked at for three and a half years. There were some uh, disruptions with trustees because my father-in-law had passed away at age 54 of lung cancer. All these four things, like a storm, you can't believe at 37, you know, so I think about that a lot, of how everything looks so smooth and placid when we moved to Chicago now and you just it just seems like almost biblical and like yosef getting thrown under the bus uh-huh. that it's truly for the best so that's the way i see my torah ellie is real life take away we'll be right back to this week's episode but first an important message from kola chabad they have been around for over 200 years helping people across israel and now more than ever they're stepping it up They have been helping families that had to abandon their homes in South Israel that are being put up in hotels and do not have access to food and shelter and different supplies that they normally have. And especially given the current climate, they need unique things. Kol Chabad is there from the north to the south, supplying much needed things, food, clothing, things that we don't really think of such as toys for the kids. They're doing it in a big way and more and more people are stepping up and donating. Click the link in the show notes, donate what you can. Someone just hit up the YouTube and said they're giving a $50 recurring donation, which is huge. That's hundreds of dollars a year in in very small amounts. Incrementally, there is no such thing as too small. Every dollar, every shekel counts. Please, whatever you can, now is the time kolchabad.org. So many people have reached out to me during this time and said, hey, who is someone credible that we can give to to ensure that the dollars are being maximized for those in need? And kolchabad.org is the place to go. So click the link in the show notes, kolchabad.org slash kosher money. I know you've heard this ad many times, but now more than ever, it is so, so, so important to help our brothers and sisters in Israel get through this time, this hard time, and we cannot thank you enough. Now back to this week's episode. A lot of people, I would imagine, would have asked why or put themselves under a rock and said, you know, all this bad is, or seemingly bad is happening to me. Was that ever a consideration? Honestly, I'd, I'd say that was just a, a, a gift 
that and I know this from, is it Shavuos where we read Eicha? I forget which holiday. We read Eicha, it says how, and not why. Tishvah. Tishvah, okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, I, you know, I have to think also, you know, even okay. going through the people come over to you a lot and, and you went through yeshiva, so you should know the answers. And a lot of times I'm like, you know, I just nod my head and I don't have all the answers, but I think I got that one. They'll Thank correct you. me in the comments if I'm wrong. But that meant so when I hear eh, not why I just, I knew better not to. And then I have a whole lifetime to, you know, I, I think about the show a lot, even though I had no in my family, but in my background. But I'm um, pretty competitive. So, you know, when I look at my wife, my family, children, gra grandchildren, I, I think if Hitler doesn't like, you know, proud Jewish children and grandchildren. So same way with disease is to learn from that, you know, and cherish. So we moved to Chicago uh -huh. and very small, you know, very humbled, you know, not wealthy like I wanted to be, but alive and with four kids and Shalom was inside Sharon. The famous story is the my I was afraid your to, youngest, right? To, yeah, my youngest to meet uh, the oncologist in St. Louis because mm -hmm. I was afraid he if he was a bad guy I would not only be sick but he would be unkind. And uh, but he was he put his hand on my leg, Ellie, and he said, "Do you have children?" I go, "Sure, three and one on the way." Why? And I didn't know because I won't have likely children after going through the treatment I'm going to go through, and we didn't. But it was Shalom Yitzhak, our dear youngest son, that was inside Sharon, but for three months. So when I was done with treatment, he was born. You know, it's something that I think about, you know, quite a bit. Wow. That, that's a lot. Everyone thinks that they've been through a lot. And then, you know, at the age of 37, 40, you know, probably lived a lifetime, you know, in 40 years that many don't see. Also, your, your your whole journey, right? You starting off the first 25 years of your life, no real exposure to Yiddishkeit. And when I was on the phone with you, I was picturing your voice, the whole accent, you know, you can't get rid of that. That's, you sound like a real Midwest, uh, mid Midwestern. And then a, a guy walks in with a yarmulke, yeah, a right. nice beard. Good. It, it took me for a loop. I was like, oh, this is, uh, you know, I even called you Steve at one point. You're like, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's Shmuel. That's funny. That's funny. Because I, you know, I have so much of that Midwest in my, deep in me, but deep, deep is it, you know, that Jewish soul that I like. I like the beard. I didn't always have a beard, only when I'm in Chicago. Mm. So you're you're an investment advisor. We've yes. had Naftali Horowitz on. You've spoken with yes. him. So tell us, what, what, do, what do you see out there in the, in this is not advice or whatnot, but what do you see in the, investment advising arena that you think is worth sharing with the audience? You know, you've been involved sure. with money your sure. entire life. I'm, I'm sure there's what you can share that will help many tens of thousands. What I tell people a lot, and half our clients are not Jewish, half are Jewish. I happen to love dealing with non-Jews because they on some level don't have a, a Yetzirah, an evil influence. They, they are... Uh, incredibly respectful, you know, of Jews that respect themselves. But they respect a Jew that they know is observant like I am because they know that we're steadfast and they know that we stay to a covenant despite all outside information because that's what a Jew is supposed to be. So a lot of investing is like that. So good investing is like being a Jew. It's simple but not easy. There was a woman that I uh, gave her a car ride in a limo uh, in Atlanta two years ago. And she wanted me to look at her money. She goes, I'm working with this certain broker, JPM, JP Morgan. And, and she sent me the statements and the broker's name was Naftali Horowitz. So I go, oh boy, it's going to be another broker I tend not to like. The wire houses so much, they right. tend to have certain issues that I don't love. And then I looked this gentleman up and was smitten very much. And really on your podcast, I learned about him and then I contacted him, which wasn't easy. He's very busy. Mm -hmm. And I can just say he's someone I admire greatly and someone that can be trusted. But one thing I want you to know, to anyone in business, get good mentors. If you're Even if your father's not a great father, find your own mentors. Mm. And if your dad's not a great, you find your own. My two mentors for Neste Group were John Bogle from Vanguard and Sanford C. Bernstein, Zalman Bernstein. And I met Zalman and he couldn't have been nicer to me before he passed away. That's another story, but I sought that out. Well, sure enough, amongst other jobs, you know, Naftali worked for 
Bernstein for many years. Mm. But the main thing is we both come to a place of serving people honestly and straight because he's God fearing, but he comes from a place, uh, you know, he's rooted, you know, I think Rebelli Melek of Lazinsk. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me even to say it, but this is a guy that's got those type of genetic biases and uses it in business. And I think that might trouble him. Like maybe you should be doing something else. In the meantime, I'm, I see his brilliance and I like him a lot. And it's like, I come to it the same type of product through RIA. And I even asked him, he happens to do his craft through now Morgan Stanley. Okay. And I asked him why I switched. He gets back to me immediately. He's totally clear. He just wants to help people and help young people. And that's what I want to do. We're both blessed to make a nice living. The other thing I'll say about what I do as an RIA, what I make in my best year, a hedge fund guy wouldn't take for a month. Mm. I don't want to do that. So I don't buy that. But I would say that it's simple but not easy and never been easier. If someone wants to find an advisor, do your homework, an honest advisor, I would suggest that you should use someone if you want to delegate it, just like I won't build my own home or in addition, I get experts. But you got to vet to make sure it's someone that loves their craft. And then you just stay close to Fidelity, Vanguard, Schwab, to your honest firms. Because uh -huh. there's red flags over the rest of the industry, but most people will fall for that in Ponzi's and they always will. Do you think society as a whole, and we'll get into the investing and saving from a young age, but do you think society as a whole, maybe America specifically, is very or overly focused on attaining wealth, that money is the source of all happiness? Sure. And that's something that's, you know, the nature of mankind. And that's why in ethics of our fathers, you know, when it says, I always say, I don't have one rich client because they say the other guy's rich, you know, that we die with one half of what we wanted. And if guy has 200, he wants 400. So there's two ways to be rich. I always say make it large income and also get by on less. And I say this a lot to think about your future self, that if I'm a doc making quite a few, you know, high six figures, maybe in a specialty, if you're driving three cars and, you know, a big turbo, you know, Carrera, you might be working extra years where I've got docs that are retired today because they took care of their future self, which meant they saved and invested well and a lot and didn't spend in a silly way. And that's for someone that's high income. So don't think someone that's high income is satisfied. They're not. You can chase your tail. So I see a lot of that. And then if someone doesn't have a huge amount of income, you know, I believe that one of my favorite phrases is livelihood, parnasa comes from Hashem, you have to show up. And I say that aggressively. Livelihood comes from Hashem, you have to show up. I say it immediately because someone will scoff at that and go, you have to work hard. And of course you have to show up. But I was brought up with some mentors back in Columbus. They say, everything's hard work, work, work. And that's foolish. You work too much. You force issues. You'll pay it back in doctor's bills, legal bill. We're taught that in, you know, Chabad philosophy, how Yom Yom says it. I see it. Or, il you know, illnesses. You're going to make what you're going to make. Accept that. That's okay. And take care of your future self. So I'm a living example. When I look at my finances today, it's... I showed up. We are certainly reaching an audience here in their 20s, 30s that are, you know, either have a nice living or they're struggling to, to get by. Until now, the, the, the episodes have not really done a good job reaching the ultra wealthy. And when once in a while, when someone hears an episode that I know has an abundance of wealth and says, hey, I'd like to be smart about, do you have an advisor for me? I'm always blown away when someone does that because you would think they'd be in a position that you've described that, hey, I'm, I'm in a good place. I don't have to worry about the future. But yet when someone is making a, a good amount of wealth, if they're smart about it today, early on, they can really set them up for success in the future. Um, so what, what's your advice to, to people younger, um, with kids, saving early? W what comes to mind when, when, you, when you hear that and someone comes to you advice? I think the first thing I always think about is find out, again, from your wife or a counselor, you know, what's your, what's your gift? What, what are you best at? What ought you be doing? What's natural for you to do? 
and then find a livelihood in that realm. And a livelihood to me is a byproduct of solving people's problems. It's that simple. What do you do for a living? I never, by the way, I never say to someone, what do you do? Somebody said that to me at synagogue this morning. I was in Great Neck Dominic, I was praying early in the morning. Someone introduced, I'm from Chicago, Shmuel Goodman. What do you do for a living? I was shocked. So I said, uh, at first I said, events advisor, I said, I'm a Jew and I fear Hashem. You know, like what happened with Jonah. You know, yeah. it's like not my favorite, but I never ask a man, what do you do for a living? I say, what do you do to put food on the table? I do it on purpose only. What do you do to put food on the table? Why? Because I was asked that when you're beaten down or you're in between jobs. You'll get asked when you're in between jobs. Ellie, what are you doing for a living? Right when you got fired or your mm. business went belly up and then you feel low. So if that happened and I said, what do you do to put food on the table? You could tell me, I go, oh, that's why I ask. Because the only reason you go to work is to put food on the table. So your aspirations really should be to be serving someone at the best possible way. And as a byproduct of serving them, you hope you make a living. I did it to make an end that I have a lot of money. And just, you know, this week's parshes, you know, pardon me, the dog and the, and the prostitutes right there this week. You're not allowed to give illicit you know, sacrifices to the temple and give it to the, you know, to, to the temple. And last week, tzedek, tzedek, justice, justice. You can't do bad things and give it to charity. And I, I see that. And the goal of getting rich um, needs to be looked at. And the goal, you know, when I told you when I was moved to Chicago, Illinois, and I felt this big, um, I think I told you when we spoke, that we're taught that we're like a seed. When it goes in the ground, it disintegrates. It disintegrates in the soil, the powerful soil, it disintegrates. And then what happens? A tree grows and there's fruits. When I moved to Chicago, I'm disintegrated. But look, when I look what's happened, and I try to tell men to accept restructuring, accept disintegration, and look at your wife, look at our kids, and you know, be grateful for that. And that it's okay to restructure and reset. So I told you on the phone and it's, you see, I get emotional when I think of it because I see so many men that won't restructure, you know, just fake it and not be real and fight that. Because the hardest thing, I've got a rabbi friend that had some credit card debt and he once had to tell his kids, they called, can I go to seminary in Israel? And my dear friend said to his kid, no, I can't pay. He could have gone to more credit card debt. He could have gone to donors. He said to his son, no. And the son sweetly said, thanks, dad. Now he ended up getting his way into the seminary. It worked out. So years later, I went back to my dear friend who I'd learned with for 30 years. I said, so-and-so, I go, from you, I learned it's hard to be real when you're a schlepper, when you're non-affluent. I go, I know from working with wealthy people, it's hard to be real. And then you realize Ellie, it's always hard to be real. So I'm around wealth. I, I, I know that and you, and I track it, you know, but I pay a lot of attention to it. So I do know that there need to be spending limits and budgeting and to, I get motivated to do it because everything you do, your kids do. So whatever you do is like a marionette. If you know what that is like a puppet, if I want a Porsche, my kids want a Porsche. You know, if I drive a nine-year Subaru, which I do in good shape, it's for a reason. There's basis. I'm not trying to be tight, but I want my kids to focus on other things and worry about their constituents, whoever they're serving. You know, King David, a famous thing. And I'm not a Toma Chacham, but King David was not, he didn't refer to himself as King David, King of Israel. It's King David's servant of Hashem. So I think about that. My, my imposters are my clients. We'll be right back to this week's episode, but first I want to tell you about a new sponsor. It's another podcast, and it was created by the OU and Jen Olive, and the podcast is about parenting. There are no manuals when it comes to parenting. You can learn from experience, you can learn from others, but now you also have the opportunity to hear from experts, and no greater time than today to learn how to cope during crisis. They have a whole series on it. Highly recommend checking it out. There are different episodes. We're going to play a quick snippet so you can get a little bit of a feel, and then we'll return to this week's episode. How do we talk to our children? How do we deal with their various emotions? 
first things first, preparation is key. I love this quote. I've said it before. If you fail to prepare, you are preparing to fail. And this conversation is so important. It must be a conversation where the parent is fully prepared for the question. Parent has to come into the conversation with facts ready, with answers that encourage more questions through giving confidence that you as the parent are ready to talk. Now, these conversations will look different at different ages. For younger children, maybe let's talk about ages 6 through 10, when we speak with young children about stressful and scary situations, the most important thing we can do is to validate having big feelings. It's normal. It's okay. It's okay for them to be confused. It's okay for them to be worried. And at the same time, we have to regulate the way that we talk to them because our voice and our body language, how we are truly feeling will come through. And therefore, we, like I said before, we need to take our own temperature. How are we doing? Are we really okay? We should... I think it's important not to watch news around younger children and to be careful about what we discuss around younger children. I was speaking to a parent the other day in school who was telling me that they felt that they prepared their child and then their child was in shul and was hearing all of these different things or their child was on the bus and they heard all these different things. We have to be very careful about what we say to our children or what we are discussing around our children or what conversations our parents, our, our children are going to be hearing because they're going to see or hear things that they're not yet prepared for. They're not emotionally ready to handle those things. They're not at a maturity level. They're not developmentally ready. And therefore, they will be so quickly overwhelmed. That's just a little taste of the Jews Next Door podcast. Link is in the show notes. Check it out and enjoy. Now back to this week's episode. You mentioned charity. Um, what's your philosophy when it comes to charity? Um, the, the, the person who introduced us to each other was actually your son, Shalom, who works at the Wall Street Journal. And he said, you can't sit down with an interview and talk to my father about no, money without, without discussing charity. So Hakar Satov, gratefulness to the Federation of Columbus, who got much of their prowess of giving from Cleveland's Federation. So before I was observant, the, the Federation there was very generous and Wexner would invite me to uh, parlor meetings and this type of thing. And I learned a lot about Sadaka about giving and I always wanted to be a player. Okay. So I learned about Sadaka kind of on a surface level and how important that was. And then the years went on as I learned more Torah, you see Sadaka is the mitzvah. Mm -hmm. And I used to dream about having a certain type of income if I could have an income and that to think you're giving away that much and more, it's not your money. And I love to duck because it's the ultimate tell. And when you give to duck, it's the greatest insurance policy for your business and mostly for your mental health, in my opinion. I also have a thing. I think I told you this, that I always say, if someone is in a position to give a fifth or more to Tadaka, if you do that, get a Bentley. If you ask my okay to get a Bentley, mm -hmm. but if someone gives a fifth or more, they don't want a Bentley. Mm. They don't want one. Because if you're thinking about my mentor, let's say George Rohr, certainly is one of my mentors for Tadaka. He doesn't like that he it's not anonymous, that his name's... But you, you see a guy like that does not, I don't think, drive a Bentley. Lil Warren Buffett, you know, I don't think has a yacht. It's kind of remarkable. And then in my business, I get to help people a lot when they have economic events to open up donor advised funds. It's like a foundation and help them, Jew and non-Jew. And we calculate and they go, wow, I didn't know this. They get the deduction, all that. But the main thing is that they get to give it and it's done. And I spend an awful lot of time at it. And each one at our level, Ellie, each one at our own level. So once I'm in a meeting many years ago to save a high school, and I'll never forget, I made our biggest gift, my wife and I at the time to save a girl's high school. And I think the biggest gift, it was 25 grand, you know, 18 years ago. And I'll never forget uh, someone in that room ended up making a $200,000 gift that helped save the school. I didn't know that would happen. And I realized when I did what I was supposed to do, this holy man did what he was supposed to do. So it's never the nominal amount. But to not to give tzedakah is the greatest gift. But once again, it's, it's, it's hidden because 
you have to be able to see the people that give the most have the most, and that's counterintuitive. Because if you give it away, you have less. In the world we live, in exile and gullis, that the one that had, if you have less, you have less power. You know, and I told you, look at Carl Icahn at 87, has been revealed. He was taking loans against his own wealth. And what for at 87? Why are you margining at 87? Well, to have more billions. Really? Think about that. And he's a skilled investor. Is that what we want our life to be? Look at this stuff and learn from it. Learn from the, the billionaires that I looked at and wanted to be when I'm younger. Take a look. Look at the outcomes. And I, I, always, ha I, I always have, and I really do. And to younger people in the audience, take a look, see of what you really, you know, what you really want, what's eternal. Because anything that's business is not eternal. You're allowed to put food on the table. But the only thing that's really eternal are, you know, I'll say the hokim, you know, the, you know, the crazy laws that are not understandable are eternal. You know, we're taught not understandable, you know, kosherous, kosher, linen and wool, and the red heifer. Uh -huh. You know those are true because people will scoff at it. Uh -huh. And that's eternal. But the buildings, you know, high rises, none of that stuff's eternal. I love business. Even Schwab and Southwest Airlines, my, some of my favorite companies, they're not eternal. Amazon, yeah. Whenever I watch videos from the 1920s and the 1930s of people running up and down the streets of Manhattan, going to work, coming back, you know, I see a ton of energy being, you know, that, that comes through the screen. You see everyone you know, got to get to where I'm going. And none of, none of those people are alive right now, you know. Um, and I always think back, like, in 100 years, right, the effort I'm putting into working harder, working harder, working harder, where, where, where's that, where, where am I going with that? And then I think about all those wealthy people that die with hundreds of millions of dollars and gets funneled to the next generation. They had another chance at redoing it. Right. Well, I think that what you're saying is spot on. Seriously, what are you running for? And to try to take a look at that while you're, that's something the that cancer definitely helped me with. Mm. Right. When you've been confronted w with near misses, which we all, but to your point, you can't get it back. Or when you pass away, you know, uh, you're going to get to it later. And which leads me to just one thing compounding is huge. Okay. My job, Naftali's is to have your wealth compound appropriately uh -huh. over time, you know, outside of your core business, you put away money. So I came up, you know, as a Lubavitcher, you see that the followers of the Rebbe, you know, Chabad Lubavitch, why did they care so much to put tefillin on someone, some mitzvah, some commandment? Why is he obsessed? He knows something I don't know because doing a mitzvah compounds. It's just that it's not tracked by Morningstar uh -huh. and Dun & Bradstreet, et cetera but it, it compounds. So when you're alive and you're able to do mitzvah, because when you pass away, you can't do mitzvot. And you'll, you'll look back at your life, you go, I wish I did more. And then mm -hmm. it's like you put more in the S&P 500. Wow, am I glad I did that. Am I glad my broker, you know, calmed me down and made me stay in. So I think about that. So you don't regret, you know, no regret philosophy. No one on their deathbed wishes they spent another day at the office, right? You ever hear the Sam Walton uh, final three words? Seriously, I love Benjamin Blight. Do you know him? The yeah, yeah, he was here. He was uh... really so he's dynamite and brilliant. Yeah. So I read his book, Taking Stock. Yeah, yeah. And in that book, he quoted Sam Walton. The last three words he said is, "I blew it." Check it out. Oh wow. To your point, you just he put it in the book, Benjamin Blight. It really, and he's the greatest merchant. You know, they, they earned what. 25 billion a year to this day and his kids have huge amounts of money but he'll that <laughs> i blew it he worked too much right i wish i wish people in their 20s and 30s 40s 50s got got this message so that they can learn from other people's mistakes at your age it's uh, a hoax to do things you don't understand it at my age it's uh you can write a book no one will listen i'd like to say you can meet my kids and it's not like I'm estranged from my wife and kids. I've tried to live this. But I did learn tremendously from gray hairs. That's why I'm here. That's why I learned so much from people that gave so much to me. Mm. 
You know, I don't want to learn from my, you know, uh, step in certain holes, you know, including people like Zolman Bernstein, you know, that were there to mimic. Most of us are not, uh, you know, Steve Jobs or Elon Musk's or Ralph Lauren. But the Carl icons of the world have created a life that's so centered around money that if they were to stop it at that age, what would they have? Right? I, I agree with you. I agree. I think, and I don't know him, and I'm not saying I want to, but I don't think there'd be, that's why usually I used to get Forbes as a young man. Uh -huh. And then you find out the most famous people, they tend not to have one marriage, if any. Uh -huh. They have multiple. And they don't have so many descendants. And let me tell you something. In the my business, in the, in the observant world, people tend to have blessed with children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. And I see wealthy people that chase, you know, degrees at great schools and tend not to have too many grandkids. But someone in their 70s that's rich, they'd love more grandkids. And you can't buy it, Ellie. Uh -huh. When you're rich, you can buy anything. You can't buy grandkids. They love to. And you can't make your kids procreate or you can't wish you had more kids. Uh -huh. That's why I thank God, you know, I wrote an article, Be Fruitful and Multiply, after my chemo. And after I went through that, how grateful I was, even though I wasn't that observant, that I knew the mitzvah to be fruit. I never did I think that the reason I couldn't have kids is because of health. Uh -huh. Usually it's an economic calculation. Uh -huh. So I'm so grateful for that. That's the ultimate eternity. Wow. What advice do you have for those that are stressed about staying in yeshiva when there's this push to start working, start working, yeah. right? Famous, the Rosh in L.A., Yeshiva Oel Hanan Chabad, Rabbi Wasserman, Yeshiva became a Chabad. So I went to meet the Rosh, Rabbi uh, Ezra Shochet, about that. And I, I said, is this really no English here? You know, this is now Zal, I believe, after Masifta years. And I said, they're there for two years. I go, Rabbi Shochet, why do they, there's no English. Why do they have to marinate in this completely? So luckily, maybe because I look so Midwestern or sound so Midwestern, he didn't kill me. And he told me the truth. Right? See, I'm not being a wise guy. Sometimes people think I'm being a wise guy. I don't know. So God love Rabbi Shochet. He said, Mr. Goodman, he goes, if they don't sit and learn for two years, and because, you know, my kids didn't end up getting smich because my wife's wife knew that's Chabad custom. If they don't learn for two years straight hard, then there's no different than just a righteous non-Jew. Just to be a Jewish man, you have to learn it just to know the basics. Then go do what you got to do. So if I'm in yeshiva, I would like to say get the basics and try to get the help you need to at your level to make it through. But then you can go out in the world, and the world is so desperate for a Jew that knows about Torah and mitzvahs, each one at their own level. Mm. You know, there's plenty of scientists and docs. But let's say you do, when you do go out, the more Torah you know, the wiser that you can be. Now, if you, again, if you talk about learning disabilities, all I can say is, I told you, I got to a place in my firm like Naftali, but we have different paths. You know, I can tell you that I put an ad in the paper in the Chicago Tribune for assistant to the president, my holy business partner, who's not Jewish, Jeff, is my business partner for 29 years. I see that as one of the humbling brachas in my life. Hashem, God's got many ways to get you to be brilliant. You just do your part and things can happen. So another thing I taught, if you have a choice, I taught my kids between brains and bracha, what do you want? What would you want between brains and bracha? I would think bracha. Okay, well, that comes naturally to you. I, I didn't mean to embarrass you. That's the answer. Some people will think brains. And if ever, it's, you, it's not a bad thing to have brains, like good looks or, you know, people could think uh, rich parents. I don't know. But to have bracha is really the powerful thing. And sometimes when people think brains, you know, now with AI, you know, everything gets commoditized. Mm -hmm. Your brains don't mean as much as you right. think. You know, what is good judgment? So bracha is a huge thing. And when you do your part, um, I just can't believe it. Again, it's humbling. When you, there's many ways to get to excellence.
A quick break from this week's episode to tell you about Twillery. You know them. If you're watching on YouTube, you notice that I'm wearing a button-down, super comfortable, long-sleeve shirt. A lot of people have the polo, the short sleeves. But what I love about this, it is so comfortable. Sometimes at night, I don't want to take it off. And sometimes at night, I don't take it off because it is, it's almost like a hug in a shirt, legit. If you don't have it, I recommend you getting one. It is not the cheapest shirt. I'm sure you can go on Amazon and find something that is a lot cheaper than this, but it won't be as comfortable and it won't be as durable. So if you are in the market for long sleeve shirts, they have them in white, they have them in colored, especially if you want to wear it on Shabbos. They are super comfortable. These are the button downs. Uh, next week, I'm going to try to show you um, coats. They have vests, really, really cool stuff for the winter. But I want you to take a look at this. If you're not in the market for new clothing, don't buy it. But if you are in the market for clothing, you can use promo code CHAI, C-H-A-I, at twillery.com slash kosher money. The link is in the show notes. If you are a new customer, C-H-A-I is $18 off an order of $139 or more. Highly recommended. They have so much. You know what? I'm going to snap my fingers and show you what the coat looks like. Okay, I was supposed to snap my fingers before I transitioned, but the coat distracted me. This is the coat. It is very, very, very comfortable. And it wasn't that much money. So if you are in the market for a coat, Twillery does make winter coats as well. Um, I really love their vest, which is sleeveless, because that's what a vest is. And again, it feels like a hug. It's very comfortable, durable, not too heavy. Sometimes winter coats can make you hot and sweaty. This doesn't have that feel. It has a hood, um, zipper buttons, got pockets, really nice, clean design. Use promo code CHAI. They know Kosher Money sent you. Hundreds of people have redeemed the code. It's probably well over 1,000 by now. So join us for the Twillery ride. Don't buy a code if you don't need it. Okay, now back to this week's episode. I think about that a lot because it's not always the smartest kids in the class that are the most financially successful, right? Going through it, you think, oh, this person, he's getting high 90s on every test and he's going to do very well for himself. And then when you get out into the real world, you know, the skill sets you need to succeed or even more than that, it's it's pure bracha, right? You can be the CEO of a massive corporation because you were in the right place at the right time and knew the right people. And you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. Um, success can come in many different ways. And I think about that a lot because I have friends that I thought would be very financially successful and others who I'm like, okay, he's an average guy. He'll make an average living and he's a multimillionaire. So certainly bracha, you know. That tends to drive the 90 plus the, the highest board score, the 800 board score people crazy. Mm. About success, we use the word a lot. I want to let you know that I love my mom. She's living in uh, Scottsdale, 93. May she live forever. I love her. But she refers to my, I have two older sisters. They, one of them has particularly wealthy friends in Arizona. And she calls their friends very successful, successful. It reminds me of my Bexley days growing up. Successful, successful. She doesn't know how David makes a living. She doesn't know what he does. Mm -hmm. And then one day I'm on my treadmill and I see a little pamphlet from the Rebbe. And he refers to success as the constant struggle to do what's right. And I never forgot that, and I can't say it enough. I want to be successful. What does success mean? It's the constant struggle to do what's right. So even if I have money, I don't have money, I still have to do what's right. So that means even if you're a baller and you have a bunch of money and people can kiss you, uh, your uh, ankles, you still have to call the Rav and you still have to seek counsel to do what's right for everything because I don't know. So I'm always seeking counsel. It drives my daughter crazy because I want to be successful and do what's right. doesn't mean I'm indecisive, but I literally, you know, I don't make a, a unilateral decision in business up outside of Jeff or my son Akiva, who joined the firm about nine or 10 years ago. Wow. So your, your grandfather stuttered, your father stuttered, your youngest son stutters. H how has that impacted you? That's a, that's a great question. Like the uh, challenge of uh, cancer, I saw that as an enormous challenge 
to deal with in the best possible way. Not why, but how, how to deal with it. And my wife and I spent a tremendous amount of time figuring out the best possible way to deal with this particular challenge. A lot of pressure from the outside. What are you doing for your son? What are you doing? What, what therapy? So we did a lot of that, but I'm telling you, it's really just for outsiders to, to say that you're doing stuff because it really doesn't necessarily help. Shalom so much. But I would say that to create an environment in our home where he would speak and feel strong, and he did have many uh, therapists and counselors, including when he was a yeshiva in his late teens here in New York City. And he met one particular person, Phil Schneider, that was also a counselor to the Rebbe when he had strokes. But Phil taught this beautiful way of dealing with certain tactics, but also a certain amount of acceptance, more like a half and half. And I love that he taught him acceptance, not you're gonna be okay when you're fluent. Mm -hmm. and torture yourself. And he said, Shmuel, you are so lucky that your son stutters, meaning that he's willing to the Shabbos table to speak despite the stuttering. How Shalom has the strength to do that, I do not know, but he's rather amazing. And I would just say, when I look at him, I, again, I think a lot of it is miracle. I don't want to attribute it to cause effect. I know I spent a lot of time on it, and trying to make him as strong as can be. And then he finds his wife. And I'm humbled by it. Because he, well, I didn't like him when I heard, you know, at the many places he went. Uh, he went away for two weeks to a stuttering place in Roanoke that's expert at this. When we were told his was severe, I didn't like that. <laughs> you know, that was difficult. I mean, can't it just be, you know, average on the spectrum? But I know it was difficult for my father, whose stutter was not as bad, who was also a salesman and warm. And my, my, my grandfather I was a salesman as well. But Shalom's, I know my, it was hard on my father, like he probably felt some guilt mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. But within the realm, uh, I think Shalom is a model. And he's also got some gifts that I think you know. Anytime we have a certain physiological challenge, there tends to be areas that Hashem counters with some gifts in others. And no one's listened better than him. But, and I also think about biblically, Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, we're in the fifth book of the five books of the Torahs on words, Deuteronomy. It's only after a life of action did he talk and is about words. Mm. And, you know, Shalom did a lot of listening. So mm. he has a, a sensitivity to him that's beyond. And we'll see what comes from him. But I just want you to know, we did a lot of stuff, but I don't want you to think it's cause effect. Mm. There were a lot of tough, challenging times. And um, yeah, that's very special. Yeah, no, I, I have never met him, but we, we speak a lot and he's, he is a man of action because I see he, you know, one day he's collecting for this family. Um, he's looking for a resource for that family. Um, so certainly uh, an impressive individual. And I'm thankful that he, he brought us here today. What would be your closing remarks? Maybe something we didn't hit on that is worth. I want to try to capture everything that we can. Um, this has been very, very insightful. I said, if there's two books I would write, and I don't plan to write a book, and I've read Naftali's books. Uh, he's a special guy, uh, and I don't plan to. But one of the books I'd write is, it's called In Order To. And the other book would be, if I got everything I wanted, it would have killed me. Just to think about that shtick when I tell you that, that in order to means with everything you do in your life, know what the purpose is. So it's important to make a lot of money. Why? In order that what? Well, my kids can make a lot of money. In order that what? So then go to good schools, to Ivy League schools. In order that what? In order they can make a lot of money and go to good grad schools. In order that what? So get down to what do you want to do? Plus, I do it in business because not to waste people's time. Uh -huh. Know why you're doing what you're doing and ask that question always. And ultimately, you're going to get down to a purpose and find out why we're here. And do that before it's too late. Okay, so in order to. Because when I ask you to do some of my business, please sign here in order that. But a lot of people can just be chasing their tails uh, for foolish reasons. Like I told you earlier about GPS, putting in a wrong address. Heaven forbid, you, you know, you're, you're looking at your 
your phone and you punched in a wrong address and you're getting to a where you don't want to be rapidly. Don't do that. And the other is if I got everything I wanted, it would have killed me. It just, if I had my dream when I'm in my thirties, you know, I'm going to have a hundred stores, 200 and have an exit and move to Israel, I guess. You know, I don't know what my dream was, but if I would have gotten that, if I got what I wanted and someone could have dropped it down, if my mom and dad were helicopter parents or if someone could give me what I wanted, mm. it would have been the worst thing in the world for me. So sometimes, you know, if I got what I wanted, it would have killed me. So if you don't get what you want, don't think that over time it wasn't meant to be for the best for you. And that sometimes people that get what they everything they want don't grow and they don't, you know, they're like the violin that where the strings are not taught, where they're loose, so you're dull. And I didn't ask for tests, but be careful, you know, what you want and be able to quit, you know, and be steadfast all at once because steadfastness is, is everything, you know, and being a Jew is steadfast, which, you know, one fifth of the Jews came out of Egypt, learned from the one fifth, four fifths got it wrong. And the spy story is my favorite. Two twelfths got it right. Ten twelfths got it wrong. They always will. I'm not going to learn from the tent. I want to learn from Caleb, you know, and Yahshua. And it's not, you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar. Just pay attention to Caleb. He went to the cave of Machpelah. He went to Hebron to go to our ancestors. So I see everything right there in Torah. He didn't turn on CNBC, Ellie, you know, or he didn't turn on CNN or Fox. He went to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's all there. And he made the right decision. And that's what I want to be in investing and live in my life. And so that's what I want you to, and anyone that's listening to be able to do. And if you do that, it's amazing, you know, what you can reach with bracha, with blessing. If someone does have any follow-up questions for you, um, is there a good way to contact you? Is there a website, an email address? What would you uh, recommend? Or it's okay also not wanting to be contacted. Yeah, I think someone could contact me, uh, I guess, could they reach out to you and I'll give you my email? I just don't want to say it. Yeah, sure. Uh, no problem. My personal email sure. address at Nest Egg would be terrific. Okay, great. That would be, I'd be more than happy to, Sure. you know, I stay connected with uh, many people that way and clients and their children on many matters. Sure, sure. They can uh, email us at hi at livinglechaim.com and we'll make the connection. But uh, Shmuel, thank you so much for traveling in from the Midwest and uh, joining us. It's been very enlightening and I think, and I'm hopeful that it helps a lot of people. Nice meeting you and thanks for doing the whole of your work you do. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. We're getting back into it. We wanted to take a little bit of a break given what's going on in the world and people want to hear other content. They want to be distracted and I don't blame them. So hopefully this gives you that much needed distraction. Thank you to our sponsors, our new sponsor, the OU's Jews Next Door podcast, the parenting podcast, link in the show notes. Twillery, the most comfortable clothing I've ever experienced, link in the show notes with the promo code for first time users. And of course, the one, the only Kol Chabad, help our brethren in Israel. Every dollar counts. Okay, so click the links in the show notes, support our sponsors, and help us help you for the months to come. Thank you to our friends at Living Smarter Jewish, the OU's Living Smarter Jewish. If you need finance help, advisors, um, guidance, you're not sure where to start, reach out to them. They now have a team of people assisting. They're training more people to assist. Really, really cool thing, um, what they're doing. It's 2023. You might be listening to this years later. They've probably grown multifold. And thank you to our friends at Mishpacha. You can find bonus content at mishpacha.com and bonus content in their Jewish magazines available weekly. Thank you to my brother Yaakov at Living Lachayim. The YouTube channel now has well over 400,000 subscribers and it's showing no sign of slowing. We got much more links in the show notes, uh, link to social networks, bonus video short form content, a lot of cool things. Like I always say, we're just getting warmed up. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. And I'm getting really good at these outros. Take care. See you next week. Living L'chaim.